Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants, and welcome to episode 42 of Secret Source, the restaurant marketing podcast. Seven lessons for your restaurant from the world's 50 best restaurants. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back. Super excited to be doing this podcast today because last night I was lucky enough to attend the world's 50 Best Restaurants Awards Night. So there was little old me with the luminaries of the industry, Heston Blumenthal, Gagana Nand, Anna Ross, Grant Akats, Ben Shrury, a whole heap of people there having a great time. Super exciting party. It was The food was amazing. The alcohol was great and flowing. Just really great to sort of rub shoulders with the movers and the shakers in the industry. What I want to do is pull out a range of things that I think every restaurant can be doing a little bit better so that you can start to be running the business that you want. Before we get into that, though, we had an interesting conversation with our friends from Dimmy. So we met up with the guys from Dimmy there, and we had a little bit of a philosophical discussion, let's call it, about business models. So the Dimmy model, of course, is an aggregator model. So for bookings, you've got Open Table is probably the big player in that space, Quandu, Dimmy in Australia, the guys who are taking bookings online. So they'll have a little widget that you can put on your website. In the online ordering space, you've got aggregators as well. You've got Just Eat, Eat24, Menu Log in Australia, Delivery Hero. They'll have an app where you can go, you can find a whole heap of restaurants and you can pick one and either make a booking or get an online order. Now, I said that I thought the aggregator model was a little bit old because of the fact that restaurants now want to tell their own story and they want to deal directly with their customers. And more importantly, the technology is there to enable you to do that. That's the awesome thing about the web. The technology is free and available for you to be able to do that. Now, the guys at Dimmick, being an aggregator, of course, they were saying that the aggregator model is much better and that restaurants don't want to be able to tell their own story. They don't need to be able to tell their own story because the aggregator can do that. Now, I thought, well, you know, that's interesting. I can't see how you can create a great value proposition and I can't see how you can run a great marketing campaign when you're relying on an aggregator to tell your story. So I thought, you know what, today I'm going to try a little experiment. I'm going to download the Dimmy app and I'm going to see what, what happens. So I downloaded the app and it asked for my location. So I put that in and right at the top of the list, there is a restaurant that is offering a deal. There is a 50% off coupon there. Now, in the past, we, we ran a, uh, a blog article, you know, is Dimmy becoming Groupon by stealth? I think it's very insidious when people are driven to these apps and the first thing that is driven to them is a 50% off coupon. Now, obviously, so Dimmy get paid when everyone makes a booking, what they are doing is they they are trying to drive people to make a booking. Now, they're not overly fussed where that booking is made. They just want to see a truckload of bookings. That's how they make their money. There's nothing wrong with that. And we always say you should be using as many aggregators as you can because if they're bringing a new customer to you, then that's well and good. What you want to be doing, though, is you want to be building up your own database of your own customers. So, because there's a couple of issues with the aggregator model. One, it costs the restaurants. So, very few people are driving around in Ferraris. <laughs> Probably a few of the guys from last night are. But 99.99% of restaurant owners aren't driving Ferraris. They're working really hard and they're not making a significant return, the, the kind of return that they should be making. So, you want to be cutting costs there. The other thing that is really, really insidious is that sometimes you'll get the email address from the aggregator. Sometimes you won't. Even if you do get the email address, they are building their database about each and every one of their users. Where, do, How often do they eat? Where do they eat? What is it that they like to eat? Which makes it easier for them to run marketing campaigns on behalf of restaurants. 
Lastly, of course, they're deal driven. The big differentiator, because of the fact that you can't, that there's no story being told about a restaurant. You can say, oh, I want to see all of the Indian restaurants. The only thing that really comes up is the differentiation by price. That is the last thing that you want to differentiate on. You want to be talking about quality. You want to be talking about your story. You want to be talking about the experience that you generate, not, oh, and by the way, you can have a 50% off coupon if you come tonight. That is crazy talk. It's a race to the bottom. It makes hospitality incredibly unsustainable because we all know what the cost structures are for a restaurant. The only people who are making money out of those kind of deals are the people who are charging $200 a head, knowing that they're only providing $100 worth of service, but they know that they'll get people who are going to go in and get a coupon for a $200 meal, pay $100 for it. So it's only the people who've marked it up. It's not... It's very hard to create value out of that that business model. So have a think about that. I would like to think that, you know, our I put my argument fairly eloquently about how important it is for a restaurant to be able to tell their own story. Because that's where where there's that differentiation, that's where there's value. That's where you can make a little bit of profit. I've said it quite a few times. If you're not getting the email address for someone who's made an order with you or, or made a booking, then and it's going to an aggregator, you may as well let your competitors come in and cook in your kitchen because you're giving the whole game away. If you're not building your database, if you're building someone else's, that's just crazy talk. And it's absolutely madness to be paying for the privilege to do that. So the exciting thing is that if you want to take bookings online, there's a free online restaurant booking system and that is going gangbusters. And it's interesting looking at our figures, more and more of our customers are coming from overseas. So we are now in, I think... 10 countries. I think so. We got to sign up in Norway last night, and they've put the widget up on their own website, which is that's super exciting. So it's awesome to welcome a um, a Norwegian restaurant to the Marketing for Restaurants family. And of course, that then goes on my list of places to visit. Hooray! I don't know when that's going to be, but hooray! If you want to take orders online, then there's the free restaurant online ordering system and <laughs> week on week. So the growth is always a little bit up and down with that. Week on week, it's 30%. So we've had a few big restaurants come on online recently. Absolutely gangbusters growth with that. And because bookings, you know, it's, it's usually $1 or $2 a booking. Online ordering, you know, there's people who are paying 13%. We were talking about one restaurant. They're probably going to save about $13,000 a year by using our free restaurant online ordering system. Have a really good think about it. One of the pieces of advice that we always give is if you're using a third-party aggregator, make a booking or make an order through your own through that system and then see what sort of emails that you get from them. We had someone in our office earlier this week used to run quite a successful restaurant. They're now chipping in $10,000 a month. Oh my God, how stressful would that be? Having to kick in, to, uh, working all of those hours, working you know just really, really, really hard and having to kick in $10,000 for the privilege of doing it. That is absolutely madness. Now, the interesting thing is that they said that they started taking bookings online with Quandu. Now, I'm not saying that Quandu has caused them to, to lose $10,000 a month, but they're not getting the email addresses. They themselves have admitted that it's harder to get people to come back. So they're seeing less and less repeat customers. The customers that they are getting love the place, the repeat customers, but people are making a booking online. And what they're worried about is that those customers are then getting offers from other restaurants in the area through Quandu and they're going to other places, particularly, in, as I saw, you know, just the first restaurant in the Dimmy app, 50% off coupon, you know, how much worse can that food be? How less exciting can that food be if it's 50% off? If it's 75% as good, and I know that it's, it's hard to be empirical about these things, but I can either go out twice or I can save my money. You need to think about this. What we sat down with them is, you know, we went through the website and I think this is one thing that so many restaurants need to do. Have a look at your website. So we're building, um, the number of websites that we're doing is just ramping up all the time and our packages start at a thousand dollars and that's Australian. So we're doing a few in the US now because (laughs) our dollar's so poor. It's quite good value for them in, in the US and it's all about telling that story. So, you know, the photos that they've got are great. You know, the food looks amazing. We're going to do some awesome SEO to, so that you know Google really understands what it is that they do. And then we're going to help them tell that story. Lastly, we're then going to start looking at some online marketing campaigns. We're thinking about some Facebook campaigns. These guys are $10,000 in the hole. So how do you fix that? I mean, 
Now, I'm assuming that their food costs are about 25%. So let's just say that we've got to cover the food costs only. I know that there's other costs in there, but this is just back of the envelope type stuff. $10,000 a month, that's $13,333 a month in revenue that we've got to bring in. That's $3,076 a week in revenue that we've got to bring in. Those guys are only open five nights a week. So we've got to bring in $615 a night, which let's say the average seat is worth $50. That's 12 and a half-ish seats. The average booking is three and a half seats per booking. So we're looking at having to bring in three and a half bookings every day. Now, when you say that you're $10,000 in the hole, you think, holy cow, that's a massive amount. When you think it's only an extra three and a half bookings a night, that's eminently doable, particularly with a website that works, getting the great SEO in, will probably double the traffic that they're getting right now. And they've got some really interesting niches that they target. And I know, I know that we're going to start getting some customers in there, customers who will convert to being regular customers pretty easily because we're going to get the right customers in and we're going to be able to tell that story so that they will become regular customers. But on top of that, we'll run a Facebook campaign and I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to turn this around really, really, really quickly. (sighs) So we got a little bit away from the world's 50 best. Okay, let's break it down into it. So first off, really big congratulations to 11 Madison Park. Super exciting for them to be now the world's number one. And we'll talk about a little bit about this through the podcast. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. I don't want to be in the world's 50 best. And that is an entirely rational and sane thing to think for the vast majority of restaurant owners and chefs. It is an absolutely massive commitment to start the journey towards being on the world's 50 best. And just talking to some of the chefs last night, you know, the commitment that it takes, all of the work that they need to put in, it's absolutely massive. I think that, you know, less than 0.01% of people listening would want to be in the world's 50 best. But, and this is a really big but, 99.99% of the people who are listening want to be the best at something. And these are the important bests. They might want to be the best dad that they can be for their kids or mum. They might want to run the best restaurant in their town, the best restaurant in their state. They might want to run the best pizza restaurant in the area. There are a lot of bests out there. It doesn't have to be the world's 50 best. If it is the world's 50 best, that's super exciting. But I think you've got to bring it down to the personal level, you know, and so many things come down to what it is that you're trying to achieve. The number of times I've talked to people and they've talked about how their family life has suffered because of the fact that they own a restaurant. I think that that is something that needs to be really addressed. If you're running an ordinary restaurant, then you're probably working really, really, really hard. When you get home to your kids, you're too tired to be a parent. And that's if you get to see them. Because if you're open for dinner, you won't be home before they go to bed. And you'll be asleep before they go to school. You may rarely, rarely see the kids. And on your um, rare day off, you'll just be too tired to actually do any parenting. I think that is a tragedy. And I talk about it because I hear it so often. Now, in Sydney this week, Dominic Crenn from Atelier Crenn in San Francisco was asked a question about, you know, do you think that you've had to sacrifice being a female and being the world's best female chef? So she was the best female chef for 2016. 2017 was Anna Ross. And she had a really interesting answer to that. She pointed out the fact that everyone actually makes these decisions and it often gets talked about with female chefs. The interesting thing is that no one actually recognises the sacrifice that men make as a father. Women talk about it a lot more and I don't think that men actually like to talk about openly about it. Parents, whether they're male or female, make huge sacrifices when they're working in a restaurant. Now, she pointed that out and she said then to the person who asked that question, I hope that you're making those choices too. 
And it was interesting. She then asked the speaker if he knew that she had kids or if he had just assumed. And she's actually got twin daughters. And she then said, you know, I hope that you, if you have kids, that you stay home so that your wife can go out and be a badass woman. And so this is one of the things, the conversation about why are there so few female chefs in the industry? And I think definitely agree wholeheartedly that the, the question needs to be changed. It needs to be changed for everyone, though. We need to recognise the fact that people are making massive sacrifices. And that's why I think, you know, so many people just want to be able to run a restaurant where they can work normal hours and, you know, get that work-life balance right for them. That might be what it is that you're aiming to do. So let's start breaking down the uh, the seven things that I think you can take from the stories of the world's 50 best chefs that you can then package up in your restaurant. Now, the first one is number one, work hard. Okay. It is hard work to do what it is that you're trying to do. Now, that's obvious, right? Now, so all of them work ridiculously hard. This is, it's just plainly obvious for everyone. Now, the thing is, I talk to restaurant owners all the time and most restaurant owners, most, you know, 95% of them are working really, really, really hard. They're working really, really long hours. So this is one of those things that you're already doing. You are already working really hard. You are already doing one of the things that makes these guys the world's 50 best restaurants. You're working really hard. So, you know, why is it that you aren't achieving the goals that you want to achieve? Mm. Is it the right work? Are you doing the right work? How many people are working in the business, not on the business? How many people have systematized their restaurant so that they have got more time to be doing the important things that are actually going to help them build the restaurant that they want? That's the first thing. I want you to think about what it is that you actually do. I'm not saying that that's an easy thing to do. At Marketing for Restaurants, this is one of the things that I struggle with. There's a lot of things that I do and it's like, you know, I'm trying to cut back my hours as well. So team, I'm with you on this. You know, I'm working really long hours, and but I am now really focusing on let's start delegating, let's start mentoring our team. These are the start of things that we want. The second thing, you have to build a team that's going to work, teamwork. That is what is going to en- enable you to work really hard on your restaurant, not in the restaurant. Hire the right people. Fire the wrong people. Hire for attitude. Train for abilities. All of those things. And, you know, the restaurant that came in this week, they spent the first 18 months of the restaurant's life getting the team right. They had people who were not helping and were making things work and they had to get rid of those people. And it's not easy to just go and and sack everyone. It's tricky to do that. That process definitely takes time, and but you need to work towards it. You need to understand that you've got to get a team that's going to work with you. The third thing, you've got to have a purpose. Now, is it that you want this to be the best place that people can bring their family to? Is it the fact that you want to take the food of your homeland and introduce people in your new country, your new chosen country, to that food? Is it that you want to encourage people to be vegan? Is it that you want to cater for people who need gluten-free food? Is it that you want to celebrate great steaks? Is it that you love burgers and you want to celebrate the burger? What's the guiding light that you're trying to move towards? Too many people have lost that, you know, why was it that you opened that restaurant? You just get it beaten out of you. You've got to have a purpose. And it's really important because in those days when, you know, you're down a chef and you're down someone front of house and it's super busy and the world is just super chaotic, half your deliveries didn't come in, it's that purpose. That is what uh, help you to power on through that day and that is what's going to help your team power on through. The fourth thing is leadership. 
the leadership is really important because you need to communicate that purpose. You need to invigorate people with that purpose. You need to get people to work towards that purpose. So we spoke about leadership a couple of episodes ago. You know, the definition is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. The purpose is really exciting about that vision, BHAG, whatever you want to call it. Why do people come to work in your restaurant? And you know what? It's the hardest thing to do in a restaurant industry because a lot of people are on minimum wage. Super difficult to do because you can't be paying, you know, mega bonuses to everyone if they do do a good job. Not easy to do. So, and we've talked about culture a lot. Have a think about that. How are you going to be a better leader of your team? Fifth, the fifth point, technical excellence. Too many people accept substandard work. And I think that, you know, you need to work really hard to stamp that out at every point. In our office, it's open plan. And I will, you know, someone will be on the phone. I thought, what was that about? Oh, you know, so why was it that something didn't happen? What happened with our, our processes here? Or, you know, is someone not following the processes? Is there an issue with the processes? Because I want to be able to provide the best experience for everyone. Now, I accept failure because, you know, you can't get it right all the time and the team knows that. In some respects, we build that in. But we're all striving to provide the best kind of experience possible for everyone. Will Gadera at 11 Madison Park, he said that. He said one of the things that makes their restaurant great is that you have got an amazing chef. His best friend is the chef working really hard to lead a kitchen that is producing amazing food. But their general manager who's running front of house is working really hard to make sure that the food that everyone works in the kitchen works so hard to produce is presented in a way that is appropriate with the amount of work that's gone into it. You don't want to put all of that effort into producing amazing food only to have front of house drop the ball on that. And likewise, it doesn't matter how cheery, how engaging, how super excited front of house is. If the food's crap, the food's crap. You've technical excellence across everything that you do. You know, technical excellence in your marketing, technical excellence in your accounting. You know, how often are you you doing stock control? Are you keeping track of inventory? Technical excellence across the broad range of disciplines that is required to run a restaurant. Six, always learning. Now, I'm super keen to do a podcast with Anna Ross. So she is the best chef for 2017, which is super exciting. And, you know, I think it's really important that we get more gender diversity within the industry. But I want to speak to Anna because she is the world's best chef. She is self-taught. I think that that is the most inspiring story. Now, she is an overachiever. So she's an Olympian. She was planning on being a diplomat at the United Nations. Really, really high achieving. But fell in love with a guy who was the sommelier at his Franco and his parents stepped away from the restaurant, left him to run it. And he was like, well, I'm a sommelier. I'll do the sommelier work. That left someone to run the kitchen. And she said, I'll do it. Now, not prepared to be a cook, let alone a chef. She is now the world's best female chef. I think that is absolutely amazing. Where is your commitment to continuing to learn? Because if she can do that, and this was one of those things, like I would be interested to know at what point was it that she thought, you know, we're going to create an amazing fine dining restaurant. How far down that journey did she get? How far down your journey are you going to get? Where is that journey going to end? Because like that is an amazing story. She is up against all of these people who have dreamed their lifelong dream to be a a chef in their own fine dining restaurant, ranked in the world's 50 best, she was able to do that. And I think that this is a really inspiring story. You should take from that the fact that whatever it is that you've got going on in your life, you can get better 
and better and better. And the sky is the limit. I think that's super exciting. Seven, persistence. I think it's really interesting, particularly whenever you're doing something different, whenever you're doing something new. And the story of Massimo Bottoro from Austria, Francescana, he was work, uh, producing, you know, modern Italian food. And it wasn't well received because of the fact that in Italy, the food was kind of sacred. It was the way that it had been cooked like that for generations. So we didn't want people messing with it. He was messing with it. And he was doing it for three years. And they were three long years. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it sounded like there was a bit of a financial burden in there. You know, it would be really tough doing that, working that hard and not getting any feedback that you were on the right track until there was a car accident and it meant that there was a big traffic backlog and there was a food critic who was going through his town and thought, you know what, I'll stay overnight and I'll I'll visit Massimo's restaurant. He visited, really liked the meal and said, you know, this is the future of Italian cooking and that flipped the switch. Then it became popular. And I think that it's really interesting because this goes to the heart of what is the role of the food critic? A food critic can't jump on every crazy thing that every chef is doing and say, wow, this is amazing. It's going to be the new thing. But at some point, they need to recognize talent, genius, and write the review about that. Until you build that dominant narrative, until you get that story out, you need to persist. And that's when you're successful. So Massimo was at that point. He spent three years. Now, obviously, he's continuing to evolve it, but doing a great job for those three years. It can be really difficult when you're not successful before you've reached that point where you're running a great restaurant. Now, whether it's recognized by other people or not, whether you're working through getting a great team, that's one of the things that you're going to do. If you're in the kitchen, what is your personal journey? How are you going to get to a point where you're comfortable expressing what it is that you do? What is the addition to what you are doing now that is required to make you really great? And how are you going to get there? Until you take that journey, you need to persist. How many people give up before their time has come. And I think that's one of those really, really important things to think about. You know, just that persistence. So many of these chefs have got those stories about the time that they were in a very, very, very dark place. Now, the world's 50 best is made up of the 50 best people running the 50 best restaurants now. Interesting thing is, that none of the people who gave up were at that awards night. If you give up, you're out of the game. You need to think about that. Now, the eighth on the list, innovation. Innovation and creativity. I, I think that it is absolutely critical in everything that you do. And what is it that you're trying to achieve with your restaurant? So you've already thought about your goals, your own personal goals. You need to be innovative Because I think that far too many restaurants stand far too still for far too long. And that really, really hurts them because people's tastes change, the industry changes, products change. There's change going on all around you. If you're not changing with that, it's only going to hurt you. Um, You you look at the product, you know, so Grant Ackett's with his helium balloon, green apple taffy, you know, a signature dish that everyone talks about. A lot of work went in there to create that. Heston Blumenthal, so he got the Diners Club Award for a Lifetime Recognition Award. The work that he has done, where he has married up history, historical cooking techniques with his amazing technical excellence to create some truly mind-blowing dishes. It's interesting because they're taking things from outside the kitchen to produce the product that they serve up inside the restaurant. So, and I know that Heston Blumenthal, so he works with um, Darren Brown, who's a magician to do some of the things that he does. He also works with Charles Spence, who's a psychologist who works on the psychological interplay between 
food and the way that it is presented. And the interesting example is bacon and egg ice cream. Now, it's described as tasting a lot more bacony when people listen to the sound of bacon cooking. It's these little things where people are bringing all sorts of interesting things from outside of the restaurant, whether it's an experience at an art gallery, new product, new techniques, new cooking techniques, new ways of presenting the food to their customers that allows you to be innovative. And I think when we talked about persistence, one of the things that we didn't talk about was failure. And it's really important to embrace failure. And I've said it before, you know, I think it's really important, you know, your specials board, that's the perfect place to embrace failure. You can put something up on the specials board and if people don't like the way that it's described, they won't order it. So change the description. If people order it but don't like it, then change the recipe or maybe get rid of it. Maybe it's never going to work. But you have got the ability to rapidly iterate through menu items through your specials board. It is custom designed for innovation. You could be continually iterating through a menu that is going to change frequently, which means that people are going to come back to the restaurant more often because they like your food and they know that there's going to be new things there to taste. And if it fails, it fails. A lot of people are afraid of failure, you know, and you should embrace that across the entire spectrum of all of the things that you do. So not everyone got to go to the World's 50 Best Restaurants announcement. We live streamed a few of the a few of the interesting bits and pieces. If you didn't, I would highly recommend that you watch Chef's Tables on Netflix. A series of documentaries about some of the amazing chefs who get featured in the World's 50 Best Restaurants list. I think that that's a, a great place to start to try and get some inspiration about how you can be more effective in the restaurant that you run. A big shout out for the team at World's 50 Best. It was a great event. One of the, I've been to a few awards events and that was one of the best ones I've ever been to. And it was just super exciting. The thing I love about hospitality is just how collegial it is. You know, people were really happy to see other people's success. You don't see that in a lot of other industries. You don't see someone get announced as number one and people just, you know, so happy for them. In fact, I can't think of another industry where you sort of see that sort of where you see that sort of reaction. People were genuinely happy for the people who won awards on the night. That's about it. So just recapping, you know, first off, start off with what it is that you want to achieve. If it's not going to be to be listed in the world's 50 best restaurants, then what is it that you want to be the best at? You've got to think about that. And that's an internal question. That's a question for you to work out. And I think it's a big opportunity for everyone to step up to the plate as parents, you know, because parenting is probably the most important thing that all of us are going to do. But, you know, for everyone, it's it's all individual. So what is it that you, how is it that you want to make your mark on the world? What is it that you want to achieve? And then start thinking about the hard work. Make sure that you're doing the right work teamwork. Make sure that you've got the team working for you. Make sure that they're pushing in the right direction. Make sure you've got the right team behind you. Purpose. What's the purpose of the restaurant? You know, how does that align with your personal purpose? Leadership. Think about your leadership. At the end of the day, you're responsible for it. You know, that's why you get paid the big money. (laughs) That's why you get paid the big money. Technical excellence. It doesn't matter what kind of restaurant. and, And you know, Food trucks are a perfect example of this. You can see there are some food trucks out there where the food is just epic and it's because they have that commitment to technical excellence. Whatever it is that they cook, they cook it exceedingly well in the limited confines of the equipment that they've got. Always be learning. You know, I don't think anyone knows it all you can always be learning and that learning that's one of the things that gives you an edge against all of the competition persistence it is a long road the things that are worth it in life none of them get offered to you on a platter or very rarely you've got to work for it you've got to persist until you're there innovate unleash your creativity go through that. And we did a podcast on creativity. So there's plenty of ideas in there. It was a really popular podcast, by the way. A lot of people were really interested in it. It's had lots of downloads. So as a part of that, embrace failure. You know, we all fail. Failing is a part of being awesome, I think. 
embrace it, be one with it, know that it's going to happen. When you fail, how are you going to deal with it? That's it. I hope that you have the best week in your best little restaurant. Now, if you liked the podcast, please leave a rating in iTunes. It helps us to spread the word out. If you see one of our ads on Facebook, please tag a mate in, another chef, another restaurant owner who could do with listening with the podcast. 108 countries now, and it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, it's super exciting. The thing I get really excited with is when someone signs up for a Frollo or a Forbes in a far off country, somewhere like Norway, because for me, that's really exciting and I would love to go to Norway someday and I would like to make a booking using the free online restaurant booking system and go to someone's restaurant in Norway. That would be epic. It's probably a little way away yet, but that's we're moving down that track. Hit us up on Facebook or LinkedIn. We're sharing more of our information on LinkedIn now and we're getting, um, getting lots of LinkedIn requests, which is awesome as well. That's it. Have the best week in your best little restaurant. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits, or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.